Hello and welcome to Fenextra TV. We're reporting from UK Fintech Week and we're at IFGS in London. Kindly joining me now is Sophia Bantendidis from City. Sophia, it's wonderful to see you again. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. It's great to be here in person. I know. And a, a really good event, uh, which I know you've been very busy at. And just yesterday, you were on a panel session talking uh, on the panel. Let's talk about Tech Baby. I really catch you on uh, and covering those emerging trends that are really yeah. reshaping the financial services industry. And one of the really big ones that came out of that was uh, tokenization mm. by blockchain. Uh, a topic that we haven't actually discussed enough of, I think, during IFGS. So mm. let's start there. Where are we up to with that trend? Yeah, it's a really good question and very timely for us at City in the department that I work in, City Global Insights, because we just published a big report on tokenization and yeah. blockchain. It's titled Money, Tokens and Games, Blockchain's Next Billion Users and Trillions in Value. Now, like you said, the potential for tokenization via blockchain, it has been talked about quite a lot in the past. Um, and we think blockchain is quite different to other types of disruptive technology because yeah. it enters the sphere of money and value mm -hmm. and it enables us to transfer money. Now, we're not at the point of mass adoption because to be powered to mass adoption, it needs certain things. Yeah. It needs the support of big ecosystem players as well as their involvement. So sovereign institutions, big financial institutions, big corporations, etc. And it needs collaboration amongst different participants, standardizations of platforms, interoperability, yeah. and compatibility with existing technology and software. So it's going to take some time. And blockchain is not going to have a you know, chat GPT moment. It's a different type of technology. It's a back-end infrastructure technology. It doesn't have that prominent user interface, which makes it more difficult to see and feel how it is innovative. But we think we're at an inflection point and that the growth of blockchain by 2030 will be measured in billions of users and trillions of dollars in value. Well, that's very exciting, a very positive note uh, to lead off from. Um, but still, there is quite a lot to consider, is there? So how do you see the space developing and what does uh, successful adoption look like going forward then? Mm. Well, successful adoption will be when a blockchain has a billion plus users using it, but without even realizing they're using blockchain technology. And we think this is going to be driven by four different things. Number one, it's mm -hmm. going to be driven by money and CBDCs, the adoption of central bank digital currencies yeah. by big central banks. Number two, it's going to be driven by tokenized assets in gaming. Number three, it's going to be driven by blockchain-based payments on social media. And number four, the arts and collectibles, which are moving onto the blockchain because these industries resonate really well with some of blockchain's key features and characteristics, like trust, like provenance, as well as the ability for more people to invest in really high value assets through fractionalization. Okay. But let me just touch on two of those things that are really going to power blockchain to mass adoption, namely CBDC, central bank digital currencies, yeah. and gaming. Now, CBDC is the adoption of these things by really big central banks, we think is really likely by the end of this decade it is likely we will have CBDC versions, not just of the Chinese currency, but also the Indian rupee, the euro, and the pound. And Events, here yeah. at IFGS just yesterday, you heard the remarks by the deputy governor of the Bank of England, who said that although they haven't made a firm decision on whether or not to adopt the digital pound, it is likely that it will happen if the pace of payments innovation continues. So these four countries that I talked about, China, the UK, the Eurozone, and India, think about the numbers. They represent a very large slice of the population, 50%. And they represent 35% of bank deposits. That's why we think, and what we say in our report, is that CBDCs eventually could attract between two and four billion users, and up to five trillion worth could be in circulation. And about half of that could be linked to DLT, or could deploy DLT, so really big numbers. Yeah. And the second thing I wanted to talk about was gaming. I mean, gosh, think about big numbers here. Yeah. Did you know that there, just last year, there were 3.2 billion gamers worldwide. My goodness, no, I didn't. Well, <laughs> neither did I until we researched and wrote the report. But that's a very large slice of the population. 
So if only a small number of those people adopt and use blockchain-based games, that's really going to power blockchain to be a success. And we think gaming is really going to drive blockchain adoption, certainly from the bottom up, and it will help make blockchain big. First with a small number of game adoption adopters mm -hmm. from um, Web3 companies in Asia, and then the West will help uh, power that to mass adoption. Now, to make all this happen and to get us to mass adoption, we also need technology enablers, course, right? Those yeah. need to be put in place. So oracles, bridges, zero knowledge proofs, blockchain-based, decentralized identities, but also smart legal contracts. And I'm talking here about the next innovation in contracts, contracts 2.0, SLCs, which we think will use DLT because of the many advantages it has. And actually in our report, we interviewed some experts and you know, they believe SLCs could provide a whole new set of rails for global commerce and finance to run on. And finally, also any regulatory barriers will need to be removed. And talking about blockchain and DLT specifically, yeah. it's very interesting when you think about the developments that just happened in Europe on the 23rd of March, with the European Union launching the DLT pilot regime yes. for financial market infrastructures, thus creating a very bespoke regulatory sandbox for DLT. And also just yesterday, the FCA announcing here at IFGS the permanent digital sandbox. Yeah. So it will be very interesting to see to what degree rules are changed or tweaked or adopted or not to accommodate DLT in the future. Absolutely fascinating and some uh, really significant stats you've highlighted there as well, uh, Sophia. So what's your outlook then here? What's the sort of crystal ball question as it were? Um, how far away do you think we are from this mass adoption then? Yeah, well it's not going to happen tomorrow, it's not going to happen you know, the moment <laughs> we stop the interview. Um, it's about six to eight years away, so there is still some time. But what's happening right now is the momentum on adoption has positively shifted because governments and institutions or in corporations, they're moving away from the theoretical research to the pilots, the trials and the proof of concept. So watch this space. Yeah, watch this space, like you say. Sophia, thank you so much uh, for delving into this topic a little bit more for us. Uh, as we've been speaking, the event's got a lot more busy around us. I mean, I'll let you get back out there and share your insights with the rest of the delegates. But thank you so much, as always, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Hannah. It's always a pleasure to talk to Finextra TV.